John chapter 15, are we all there? Verse 12. John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Somebody say friends. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friend, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that my Father, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Amen. Amen. This is my command. Love each other. This morning we're going to speak for a few minutes on a sermon titled, you can have a great marriage too. Amen? Amen? Come on, I want you to say it to yourself like you believe it. I can have a great marriage too. I can have a great marriage too. Have a great marriage too. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we pray this morning. Father, we come this morning into your presence. We come to seek your face. We turn our hearts to your word this morning because your word has all that we need for life. And it has this morning all that we need to have a great marriage. And so we turn to you this morning and we ask, oh God, that you would speak to our hearts. Father, right now I silence every distraction. Amen. I silence every wandering heart. I silence any strategy of the enemy to steal the words that you're planting in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that your word would strike the very target of our hearts. Amen. That you have intended it to strike. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. It was Easter morning. And you would have thought that these 12 nuns um, were preparing for the Easter service later in the day. But instead, they were getting into 12 fish barrels trying to get smuggled out of their convent. They're trying to get out. This entire scheme was devised by a man named Martin Luther. No doubt, many of us have heard about him. He's the great German Protestant reformer. This whole scheme was put together by Martin Luther. Martin Luther, just in case you don't know him, he lived from 1483 to 1546. He is considered to be one of the most prolific and influential men in Christianity outside of the Bible. Great man, great man. The story is that, his story is that one day he was walking along the path and he, he nearly got struck by lightning. And so he took that as a sign from God. Oh, God must be unhappy with me. God must not be happy with me. And so he decided, all right, God's not happy with me, so I'm going to commit my life into ministry. And in his day, he decided to go into, to become a monk. Amen. Amen. How many of you are glad for the grace of God? Amen. We are saved by what? Grace. grace. And not by works. Amen. So in any case, he decides to go into the, to become a monk. He took a vow of celibacy and poverty. And, and as he studied the Bible, looking at all of God's commands, he, he, he realized how woefully short he fell of God's standards. And so he decided that he needed to harm himself. I, I, I'm wretched and I'm, I, I'm woeful. And so he, he started to physically harm himself. To pay God to atone for his sins. And as if by his own suffering, he, he could work out his own salvation. He read scripture and came to that conclusion. This Wednesday at Bible study, we talked about this briefly. 
It's not how you read scripture. It is the interpretation of scripture. Amen. We can misinterpret scripture. Brother Samson, I believe, shed light on this on Wednesday. We can misinterpret scripture and come to false conclusions. We can live, misinterpret scripture and, and, and live lives of bondage. And lives that hold us ensnared. But I need to move on in the interest of time. But be careful how you interpret scripture. Amen. Amen. It is grace that saves, not works. Yes, there will be works. Amen. But it is the grace of God that saves. But in any case, Martin Luther had this perception. And then one day he had an amazing moment while studying the Bible. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for God taking the written word and shedding his light on it. Amen. Amen. Taking the logos and producing rhema. Amen. Amen. But one day Martin Luther had this amazing revelation as he read from places like Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Hebrews 10.38, where it says, The just shall live by faith. And thank God he came to the realization that I'm not saved by my works. I'm not saved by what I do. I'm saved by Jesus and his grace. We're going somewhere this morning. Amen. Amen. And so in some regards, this was what birthed this great movement, the Protestant Reformation. It led to a massive change in how Christians viewed their salvation from God. Martin Luther led this great revival, if you would. He was at the forefront of this massive global change that brought about the Protestant movement. Amen. Yeah, amen. And as part of all of this, Martin Luther concludes that it is a good thing to get married. You see, he was a monk, and so he had taken a vow of celibacy, but as God revealed this to him, he comes to the conclusion, it is a good thing to get married. Children are a blessing from God. Scripture says that, right? Yes. Children are what? A blessing. Thank God we're dedicating one this morning. The gift of the, of the fruit of the womb is his reward. And so Martin Luther comes to this conclusion, I'm going to quit being a monk. I'm going to go enjoy my life. And um, he was a bright legal mind, um, authored many, many wonderful literature. And one of those he wrote, he wrote a little track called On Monastic Vows. And in it, he renounced his vows to celibacy, and he encouraged other monks and nuns to do the same. And so this little track that he wrote, On Monastic Vows, found its way, as you can imagine, um, into this particular monastery that we're speaking about. This particular convent, excuse me, that we're speaking about. And, and these, specifically, these dozen nuns got their hands on it. And they read it and they said, wow, no, this is true. Marriage is good. Children are good. We want to go enjoy our lives. And so they wrote a letter to Martin Luther, essentially asking him to get them out of the convent. Amen. <laughs> Essentially saying, help us out, smuggle us out. And again, we need to move quickly. So, long story short, they got out successfully. Many of them went back to their families, got married. But there was this one woman in particular that no one would marry. No one would marry. Historically, the story says that she was unattractive and unpleasant. Uh, but whatever the reason, no one would marry her. And so finally she goes to Martin Luther one day and says, listen, I was minding my own business in the morning, in the convent. I was living a life of celibacy as a nun, a, a lifestyle that I had known since the age of 10. Minding my own business until I read your tract. And based on your teaching, I renounced my life as a nun, a life that I had known. I, I renounced everything. And so now you owe me a husband. <laughs> you owe me a husband, and if you don't find me a husband, well, you're single, so marry me. 
How many of you know that that's bold for a gal in any age? I don't care whether it's the first century or the 50th century, that's bold for a girl. But in her own age especially, that was very bold. It was especially bold. To cut the long story short, they got married, um, even though he wasn't really that interested. Um, <laughs> that's what the story says, but they got married. In fact, it says his friends wept bitterly. <laughs> Why did you marry her? <laughs> His friends wept bitterly and, um, I mean, th their marriage initially started out very awkward. I mean, you can imagine these are, he was 40 before he got married. How many of you have seen the movie The 40 Year Virgin? Yeah. This was the original 40 Year Virgin. Yeah. Amen. He was, so it was 40 years before he got married. His wife, I don't know how old she was, but they were both already adults. Socially awkward, they were not used to being around the opposite sex, as you can imagine. And so the story goes that their marriage was very awkward. Initially, I mean, she would just throw out random stuff like, so who's the king of Prussia? You know, trying to make conversation with her husband, you know, and it just really wasn't working. They were socially awkward. Um, but a strange thing happened over time. A strange thing happened. They began to build an amazing friendship. And we can tell not from Martin Luther's theological writings or his statements of faith, but we can tell from some of the letters that he wrote. His tone begins to get really affectionate and sweet towards his wife. They began to connect. There was a time when she had a dream. She saved his life. She had a dream that if, if he went on a trip that he would get killed. He would get waylaid on the way. And so he to she told her husband and said, I don't think you should go on this trip. And, and he trusted the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through his wife and, and didn't go on the trip. <clears throat> then he got a letter later saying, it's a good thing you didn't come. It's true. There was a plan to kill you. You would have been killed. They began to build an amazing friendship and a great trust. She became a great confidant and ally. As he's writing letters and books, she would literally just sit beside him as his friend and we see him including her in some of those writings. Catherine's here, he would say. She says hi. In some of his letters, he would call her by names. Lord Cati. Yeah. Dear Rib. The Empress. My sweetheart. A gift of God. Dear wife. He would call her by names. And... And, then, and they began to get tender toward one another. And so what started out as a, we're not really into that, we're not really that much into each other, we're not really friends, <clears throat> we don't really like each other, we're not really interested in you. This is just a marriage, purely for functional reasons, so that we can have children and, and not be alone. What turned out into a functional marriage Sorry, what began as a functional marriage soon turned into a glorious marriage. Amen? Amen? They had a friendship in a time, in their marriage, they had such a close friendship in a time when marriage was primarily functional. They were close friends. They developed a relationship. And here's a statement he gives later in his life about his wife. He says, there is no more lovely, friendly, and charming relationship communion or company than a good marriage. What he's talking about, brothers and sisters, is friendship. He's talking about being friends with his wife, his spouse, even though if you looked at that marriage from the outset, there was almost no hope. You would have written it off, <clears throat> come to the conclusion that it's only a matter of time before this marriage fails. And yet by the grace of God, they developed a friendship. They developed an intimacy. Somebody say intimacy. Intimacy. Intimacy, intimacy literally means into me see. They were open with one another. My life is open. I want to be your friend. I want to do life with you. I want to share life with you. You see, brothers and sisters, it is possible, as we have done, 
or not as we have done. It is possible, rather, to know all the scriptures on headship and submission and, and, and the roles and gender. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to you and respect your husbands. But it is possible to know that just in your head and not have a friendship with your spouse. And not have a relationship with your spouse. During this series, we've read from Genesis 2 verse 18. We won't read it today because I really want us to get on in the next few minutes here. But we've read, God says in Genesis 2 18, God says man is alone. It's not good for man to be alone, excuse me. I will make him a helpmate fit for him. A helper fit for him. What was God saying? God was saying man is alone. Man needs company. It's not good. This is before sin enters the world. And God says this is not good. And what is God's solution to man's loneliness? He gives him a friend. Essentially, he gives him a friend. It's marriage. That's God's solution to man's loneliness. Friendship is to make conversation. It is to share a joke, to perform mutual acts of kindness, to read books together, to go on trips together, to share in trifling and serious matters, to disagree even without animosity. That is God's ideal. The book of the Songs of Solomon, chapter five, verse 16, the wife there says of her husband, she says, this is my lover and my friend. It gets personal, folks. This is my lover and my friend. You're intimate. Your life is open. I want to ask you one question this morning. How is your friendship with your spouse? That's a rhetorical question. But how is your friendship with your spouse? And you might take it one step further. When you get home today, you may ask her if you're bold enough or ask him if you dare. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate yourself as a friend? Ask, how would you rate yourself as a friend? So ask, sorry, how would you rate me as a friend? Right? How would you rate me as a friend? It's not good for a man to be alone. It's possible, we said it earlier in this series, it is possible to be married and still alone. It's important that we cultivate a friendship. We won't have time to talk about it this morning, but we talk, why, why did God, in his, why, why is there a trinity? Have you thought about that? Why is there, why is there, a, why is there a trinity? Jesus called his disciples his friends. We read it in John chapter 15. He says, I don't call you slaves anymore. I call you my friends. And if we look at Jesus' earthly ministry, he had, many he, had, he had many disciples. And so we know that there were many people that he would consider his friends. Amen. 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 Jesus said, you're, if, if you're my disciples, then you're my friends if you're my disciples. But Jesus had three close friends. Peter, James, and John. They're there with him in the most intimate parts of his life at the Mount of Transfiguration. They're the three that are referenced. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they're the same three that are referenced. They're there with him in, the, in his most glorious moments of life and in his most trying moments of life. Those three are with him. Even though there's many disciples, there's many people called his friends. And I think we can learn something from this, from Jesus here. We are to be friendly to all people. Amen. Amen. But I think that we are to reserve friendship for a few. And that we are to reserve close friendship for an even select few. And I propose to you this morning that you are to reserve the closest friendship of all. For just one. One relationship here on earth. And that is for your wife or for your husband. That your wife is to be your closest friend. Friendship is expensive. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. It's expensive. It takes time, money. It takes commitment, energy. Oh, she did this. She did that. We got to make up. It's, it, it, it takes time. It takes resource. So you can't afford to be friends with everybody. And if you see somebody that's trying to maintain a close friendship with the world, it's a lie. It can't happen. You get burned out. And it's so tempting to think it, we can live that way in this day of Facebook and Twitter. And everybody is my friend. But friendship, and so again, hear me right. I'm not saying don't go and unfriend all your friends from Facebook, amen? <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Be friendly to all. The Bible says he who wants a friend should be himself friendly. So be friendly to everyone, but close friendship. That you invest time. That you meet often. Reserve it for a few. And as a, fa as a couple, by the way, I think you have to do this individually, but even as a couple, who are your close couple friends? that you're doing life with. Maybe somebody that's at the same level with you, in the same season of life that you can share with, problems, challenges, joys. And then I'd recommend having an older couple, maybe five, 10 years down the road ahead of you. You admire their lives, don't just randomly pick, amen? Don't just mini, 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 mo pick, amen? <laughs> but prayerfully pick, see their lives, see the fruit of their lives. And the fruit is not just children, by the way. But see their lives. Do you admire their lives? Do you, do you want to be like them 10 years from now? Then pick a couple like that. And be friends with them. Spend time with them. Invest with them. Seek advice from them. See, when you build those relationships, they help you stand the tests of life. We'll talk about the test later. They'll help you. Actually, let's talk about it now. They'll, talk, they'll help you withstand the tests of life. They'll help you withstand the challenges. And I don't want to end this series that we're going through right now. And I believe God will give us the grace to talk about this more in the future. But I just feel like the Holy Spirit is bringing this series to an end. But I don't want to end this series this morning without talking about something that's very important. You may say, Pastor, I'm here. It's all well and good. I, I know that that God wants me to have a great marriage. I, I know the scripture, husbands love your wives as God loves the church. Pastor, you're painting an idealistic picture. Um, it, it sounds good, it's great, but, but that, that's just not where I'm at, Pastor. My marriage is not there. In, in fact, Pastor, I've, I've fallen out of love. We have issues. We, we, we fight. Pastor, we, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not happy. And if that's you this morning, I want to end this series. I don't want to end this series without taking time to speak God's word. Because God's word is true. Amen? Amen. Repeatedly in 1 John chapter 4, God say, the scripture says God is love. And I want you to know that God can heal your marriage. Amen? Amen. Scripture says God is love. Repeatedly it says God is love. And what it is saying is love doesn't begin with us. Amen. Amen. Love doesn't begin with us. It begins with who? God. Matthew 5 verse 43 to 47 teaches us. Jesus says love your enemies. So it's possible to love even your enemy. Now I'm not saying your spouse is your enemy. Amen. Your spouse is your friend. Your spouse is your closest friend. But scripture teaches us that it's possible to love somebody that's your enemy. And God can, and what I'm saying this morning is that God can help you love a spouse that you don't feel like you can love anymore. God can ignite the fires and the passions of love that may have waxed cold. I've seen God heal marriages. Amen. Amen. I've seen God bring marriages that were on the brink. Right on the very brink and bring them back and heal them. I've seen God work in my own marriage. Bringing healing. Where there were issues, God brings healing. And I want to caution you against something. You may say, well, I, I need to follow my heart. My, my, my heart doesn't love him anymore. It doesn't love her anymore. I say, don't. Don't, don't follow your heart. Amen. Amen. Scripture teaches us, Proverbs 4.23, it says... Guard your heart. Amen? It doesn't say follow your heart. It says what? Guard your heart. 
Jeremiah 17, 9 teaches us that the heart can be deceptive. And so that's why God says, don't just follow your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. And I'm saying this morning to somebody, even if your heart is it's, it's no longer there, even if your heart has waxed cold, guard it. Guard it. Guard it because God can do something for your marriage that no one else can. And I'll prove it to you. And we won't read it this morning. But in Matthew chapter 1, we see the story of Mary and the story of Joseph. And Mary's, I forget the word, but she's a spouse. Thank you. Betrothed. I was trying to go there, but it was too complicated for me. She's betrothed to Joseph. And we see that Joseph has made up his mind. He's a godly man. He is going to, he's made up his mind. I'm going to put Mary away privately. I'm going to do it respectfully. And I don't want to make a scene of this. But in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20, we see God come to Joseph through an angel and say, Do not put away Mary, your wife. And God convinces him. And I'm telling you this morning, God can do something for your marriage that no one else can. God can do something. God can heal your marriage like no counselor can. God can put his hand on your marriage and the flames of love will be shooting right into the air again. And so I say, hold on to God. Believe God. His grace is available. And rather than give up, rather than check out, that you stay connected, that you stay engaged, and that you pray over your marriage, fight for your marriage. Because the enemy is waging war against your marriage. Fight for your marriage. Pray scripture over your marriage. The mar marriage is honorable. It is not the will of God that, that spouses should be separated. Amen. Husbands, love your wives. I decree over you, my husband, you will love me. Wife, you will respect me. Begin to pray, into, pray and fight over your marriage. Don't give up on your marriage. The enemy wants your marriage. Why? Not so much so that he's interested in, in the marriage itself, but think about all God can do through your marriage. Scripture teaches us, God says to man and woman, what be fruitful and multiply. multiply. It is God's, God wants your marriage to be fruitful. I said it earlier, fruitfulness is not just about children. God wants souls to be saved because of your marriage. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? We don't have time to read it this morning, but I think it's in 2 Corinthians where, where it says that we are able to comfort others with the same comfort that God has given us. God wants the things that you're going through to become a platform on which many, many other marriages will be blessed, will be saved, will be healed, will be delivered. God wants your marriage to be fruitful. God wants people to look at you and your spouse and say, this Christianity is too good. Just because of the way brother and sister are living and enjoying their lives, enjoying their marriage, I want to know Jesus. I want to get to heaven someday and hear somebody come to me and my wife. We won't be man and wife then, amen, <laughs> scripture teaches us. But we'll be best friends, right? Amen? <laughs> scripture doesn't say we can't be friends, right? So we will be best friends, amen? But I want someone to come up to us and say, I just thank God for you and your then wife because here is the fruit and maybe they'll point to 10 generations of children that know God that made heaven because their parents didn't divorce because when they, when, when they saw something from my marriage, from your marriage they said I, I can do this I'm going to fight for my marriage. I'm going to believe God. And God brings the same healing that he brought to your marriage. He brings it to their lives. And so if that's you this morning and you're, you're in a difficult place in your marriage, I come this morning not with words of confirmation, but again with the words of the grace of our Lord Jesus. That his grace is available. And we're going to pray in just a few minutes. I want us to pray for every marriage in this church, whether you're in a great place, in a good 